Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on gold prices and the risks that can be uh, engendered by these rising gold prices in Latin America. My name is Ared Delgado. I am the Digital Marketing Director of America's Market Intelligence, and I'm going to be serving as a moderator for today's webinar. So before we get started, we just want to give you a quick overview of what to expect. The presentation should last anywhere from 40 to 45 minutes, at which point we're going to have a period for questions and answers. You can ask questions at any point in time during the webinar. The way to do it is if you look at your screen, you should see a series of icons in your participant panel, and one of those icons is going to be Q&A. If you click on that, it will bring up a window, and you can type your question in that window and hit enter, and we'll receive it. So we'll be able to address all those questions at the end of the webinar, and that's basically how you would uh, reach out to us in that sense. So let's keep on moving here so that we can get to the actual presentation. That This is the basic preliminaries to get out of the way. Uh, this here is a, our, our legal disclaimer. I'm not going to read it because it takes too long to go through and we'd rather get to the material. Um, but the, basically what the most important takeaway here is that the opinions expressed by today's panelists are their personal views and may not reflect the, the views of the organizations that they represent. And of course, there's other uh, information in that legal disclaimer that we encourage you to read as well when you have some time. Uh, the introductions now of our speakers, and let's introduce them now. First, we have John Price, who is the Managing Director of America's Market Intelligence. We also have Terry Heyman, the CFO of the World Gold Council. And finally, Augusto Galpi, former uh, Vice Minister of Mines for Peru. So these are going to be the speakers here today, and now I'm going to turn the floor over to John Price to talk a little bit about our company, America's Market Intelligence, as the organizer of this webinar and what we do in the industry. John. Thanks so much, Abel. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is, I believe, our 11th sort of COVID-related webinar, something that we've been doing on a regular basis, and we've built a nice following of that. Um, and we actually started planning uh, conceptually this webinar going back a couple of months um, because it was clear that um, the, the liberal monetary policies undertaken around the world were going to uh, push gold prices upwards. And by now, of course, it has already passed 2000, come back down. But certainly we can expect historically elevated gold prices uh, for a sustainable period of time. And that is, of course, a boon for the um, gold mining industry, um, but also poses risks. Um, now, at AMI, we've been studying uh, those risks for miners now for about 15 years. Um, under our natural resources practice, a practice that uh, previously encompassed both the energy sector and mining sector, because they both those sectors share a similar view of risk uh, and similar information needs surrounding their investments. However, given the differences um, in the industries, we very recently have uh, divided them, and we now have a dedicated mining practice and a dedicated energy practice. We help companies make decisions, um, and typically miners come to us at two junctures. One would be a head of investment. Um, if they're a purely financial investor, they may look to us to help them find interesting projects, um, to look at certain jurisdictions that are changing positively or negatively their investment climate to help them focus in on projects. Uh, when they are ready to take a serious look at a project, whether they're a strategic or financial investor, we will undertake country and counterparty risk assessment. We'll delve deeply into the risks that surround a particular project. Um, these days, of course, uh, social license, the acceptance uh, of communities of projects has become um, a paramount area of concern for investors. And that's something that we look deeply at for, for them. Um, we also help them come up with the, their own negotiating positions with host governments, whether they're national governments or local governments. And then, of course, once a mine is up, up and operating, they're going to continue to need um, regular intelligence and best practice sort of advisory. And we, can, and we do that for them. Um, oftentimes, it's understanding the intricacies of key stakeholders, who influences risk on the ground in, in a mine, um, who's behind uh, those stakeholders and what's driving them. Ultimately, a mine reaches out to 
uh, its stakeholders through three budgets, public relations, government relations, and CSR budgets, and making sure that those budgets are messaging correctly or targeting the right areas. You need intelligence to constantly refresh those strategies, and, and that's the sort of work that we do. Um, what I'd like to do uh, before inviting our, our esteemed guests to comment on their view of things, I'd like to walk uh, us all through a sort of economics 101 of where we are in Latin America. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, before I do that, I want to ask uh, our audience to respond to a, our first poll question. There'll be three in all. We'd like to hear from you to tell us what you consider the most important risk facing uh, miners today in Latin America, particularly gold miners. So community risk opposition, I think everyone's familiar with that. Security risk as well, although that includes both physical and cybersecurity. Operational risk, this can be things like inadequate infrastructure that can lead to delays. Um, this can be things like natural disasters that uh, can interrupt supply chain. This can be inadequate uh, human capital that um, makes it very challenging to staff up uh, mines. Reputation and with it liability risk. Political interference risk, which can come from a number of triggers, but um, certainly during campaigns, uh, we all know that the historical baggage of mining in Latin America is significant. And um, <clears throat> oftentimes, Mining, uh, particularly in periods like this where prices are rising, can become a political um, centerpiece of, any, of campaigns. And often uh, politicians will try to uh, make a name for themselves, make a position, and say things during the campaign that become very difficult to walk, walk away from once they begin governing. Um, regulatory instability risk. Again, um, there's a big difference between how countries like Peru and Chile have run their mining laws, have respected their mining laws versus other countries uh, which don't have quite the same legacy. And then economic risk, which is very much related to what we're talking about today, which is what happens when the economic situation in a producer country changes dramatically and that puts new pressure on, on miners to uh, play a larger role in the economy. So. Uh, we appreciate your responses to that. Um, very interesting community risk opposition. Uh, that is certainly what our reading has been is the, the number one most important source of risk today, notwithstanding what we're talking about today um, and, and the potential for uh, resource nationalism or different variants thereof when resource prices begin to rise dramatically as is the case. So um, we'll move on. And I'll present some findings that we have around COVID in Latin America that sets a sort of economic, fiscal, and political backdrop to our conversation today. So let's move on. One of, in, in our first uh, COVID-related webinar back in March, we did a very simple sort of vulnerability um, analysis of Latin America versus Europe, United States, and East Asia. And it was clear then to us, as it was to many analysts, that Latin America was particularly vulnerable to uh, this crisis. First of all, its hospital infrastructure was limited, um, which meant that its ability to tolerate high case counts was very limited, which meant that for uh, that combined with the fact that uh, Latin America is the most urbanized region in the world, with some of the most densely populated cities in the world. Oftentimes, um, the, least, the lower income uh, districts of these cities are, are the most crowded. And that makes it very difficult to do anything but uh, national lockdowns as a um, health response to this crisis. But in doing so, of course, Latin America, with as much as 60% of its workforce in the informal sector, a national lockdown basically puts those people out of work uh, because they cannot trans, um, they, they cannot work from home the way so many of us can. And that has had a huge impact economically on the region. 
and of course creates the kind of fiscal deficits and economic backtracking that we're seeing. As a result of that, the Latin America's admirable work at reducing poverty levels over the last 10 years has been erased. Our poverty levels will return in Latin America to where they were 10 years ago in just six months of lockdowns. Um, for most of Latin American countries, with the exception perhaps of Peru and Chile, there's very little fiscal latitude to be able to take on Keynesian counter cyclical spending the way the Germans have or even the Americans have. And Latin America doesn't have the luxury of China or the EU or the United States or, or, or England to go out and print its own money uh, without causing um, huge backlash by capital markets uh, and being penalized in capital markets. So for all of these reasons, we knew Latin America would be vulnerable. And on the next slide, um, I wanna share with you an analysis that we've very recently put together and published on our website in our insight section um, that talks about, and this is much more controversial than the previous slide, it talks about how um, COVID will actually burn out in many Latin American countries or at least in the big cities of those countries before the arrival of vaccines. Um, and I won't spend too much time on this. I, I encourage you to read the article. But basically, um, again, with the exception of small island nations in the Caribbean who could essentially seal off their borders, most of Latin America has, uh, does not have the infrastructure, does not have the policy making, um, has some of the vulnerabilities already discussed that basically make it very difficult to contain the virus. And of course, economically, they can't sustain national lockdowns forever. So what we're seeing is the massive spread of the virus. And even in countries that did a great job at first of containing it, like Peru and Argentina and Colombia, they basically have had to give up on, on the hopes of containing the virus. If there is a silver line to this, it is that we reach a disease breaking point as we've already seen in, in cities like Milan and New York um, and Madrid, there is very uh, few new cases in these places because essentially they've reached what some call herd immunization, what others call disease breaking point. And much of Latin America will reach that point before the vaccines arrive. And that's important because until that happens, until either vaccines arrive or this disease break point is reached, it's very difficult for these economies to come back because their informal sectors will be um, limited in their ability to come back. So um, we do see uh, a rebound ahead. And on the next slide, you'll see our projections of GDP growth. And across the entire region, you see dramatic downturns this year. But uh, for those who get through it, you see more dramatic, also fairly dramatic growth rebound rates next year. Um, I caution anybody to um, put too much stock in these numbers because as those of you who follow these numbers know that they've been changing on a weekly basis going back to late March. So um, these are the latest statistics and they also reflect frankly the reality and the uh, stewardship of, of different ministries of finance. Peru and Agostel can uh, um, attest to this probably has the best managed Ministry of Finance in the region today. And they would have, I think, the most honest forecast of their GDP contraction this year. Um, but we also expect a, a strong rebound next year, in part because Peru has managed its fiscal and monetary policies extremely well over the last two decades, and therefore has the, some latitude to work with um, to spend their way out of, into growth next year. But what is really of concern, I think, to miners is on the next slide, and that's to do with fiscal balances. And <clears throat> Latin America, generally speaking, um, over the last three decades, has developed, even when reasonably populist governments were in power, like AMLO in Mexico, um, they've developed um, very professional uh, institutions in their central banks and technocrat, technocrat run um, ministries of, of, uh, of finance or a hacienda they call it in some countries that have tended to follow um, you know internationally accepted fiscal discipline and this has been important 
particularly for those countries who've achieved with their sovereign debt and investment grade status and uh, their, their willingness and their in, uh, pursuit of maintaining that status has what's kept, I think, that discipline in place. But as you can see, we're going to see a huge divorce from that track record this year and next year as countries, um, even though even those who are able to maintain small spending increases like Mexico, the fact that um, VAT, value added tax revenue, will drop so much because of the hit to service sectors, um, no country will be able to maintain reasonable fiscal deficits. Now, this is not a problem alone in Latin America. It's going on around the world. The US and Europe will also have record fiscal deficits. The difference, of course, is that um, they can, the, the international capital markets allow them to take on additional debt. They're less accommodating of emerging markets like Latin America. This is what I think should concern miners because these numbers show that over the next year and a half to two years, there's going to be tremendous fiscal pressure in Latin America to find new tax revenue. And if it's not going to come from VAT, which whose tax rates are already very high in Latin America, if they're not going to get incremental or much more than incremental differences from raising their corporate tax rates, which are also fairly high in Latin America by global standards, if oil prices remain low as they are expected to do and don't uh, generate much tax revenue, then mining, in particular precious metals, will stand out as a um, beacon of hope, but also a target for um, not just uh, official government tax collectors, but also others who are looking to finance their local uh, municipality, um, others whose businesses are hurting and looking um, to miners to help them. And so this is the backdrop that we wanted to share with you. This is what we think needs to be of concern, along with the local risk issues that you, the audience, already identified as the leading source of risk. Um, and so with that, let's move on to our second poll question. Before I, oh, sorry, let me just briefly comment on what I hope will be a useful document that we wrote, um, our mining practice leaders wrote um, three years ago, which was managing mining risk in Latin America. And there's a QR code there that you can um, connect to and download the document, the PDF document. Also, you can find it on our website. And if you have any questions, we can also send it to you. But we identified seven areas of risk, the same seven areas of risk that we provided as uh, response options in our first um, question to you. And what was clear to us when we wrote this document after um, studying so many of the cases that we had looked at, as well as publicly published cases, as well as just talking to the community of miners that we know, uh, we looked at seven areas of risk. And what was clear to us is how inter interlinked they are and how they all stem really from three drivers of risk, which is stakeholder distrust, economic self-interest, political power. And here we're really talking about with, with higher gold prices and this fiscal deficit challenge backdrop, how it is a economic necessity for governments to balance their budgets. And therefore, and there will be tremendous political um, pressure on them to look to mining once again to help bail them out fiscally. And so this is the situation that miners face. Um, and with that, we'll go to our second poll question before I then um, ask Terry to join us and, and give us his perspective. So the question to you all, um, and goodness knows if we had a crystal ball, it would be a very valuable one, but let us know what you think the price of gold will be one year from now. And we've given you a bunch of price options here and we'll see if there are gold bugs or gold bears in the room. Curious to see uh, what people say here. Of 
Of course, JP Morgan and others have predicted gold will go as high as $2,500. Back in 2008 with the global financial crisis, gold dropped about 20% before then doubling in price. And this time around gold dropped, I think it was 16% um, and has since risen from that low, um, probably around 60%. So whether you believe it will echo the, uh, what happened last time or, or do something differently, we'll see here. So um, there seems to be a strongest response of somewhere between 2000 and 2250. Okay, so with that in mind, Terry, um, I wanna, I wanna um, before I, inviting Terry to speak, I just wanna uh, recognize the help and support of the World Gold Council who was responsible for about 40% uh, of you arriving today in our audience. And so thank you, Terry, and to your colleagues for um, helping drum up support for this webinar. We really appreciate it and look forward to your remarks. Thank you, John. And look, d delighted to be here and, and have this opportunity. And thanks everybody at America's Market Intelligence for, for inviting me to speak. Uh, and look, I think the way that you frame this question is fascinating. You're right, gold is, uh, been a very strongly performing asset this year, up about 30% year to date. Uh, and of course, a lot of that comes off the back of coronavirus and the global financial implications uh, and the flight to safety. And one thing that we do at the World Gold Council is help explain the role that gold plays as a financial asset, but also the role gold plays more broadly in, in society. And I think that uh, there are lots of things that we as a global community are, are thinking about in the aftermath and as indeed we're still living through coronavirus. One of those is the role that businesses play. And that really is a, is a good thing to sort of lead into this discussion. In, in a $2,000 gold price environment and uh, like you, we don't have a crystal ball and I, and I don't know where the gold price will be, but, but let's say it stays at around the levels that we're seeing it today. What are the expectations going to be on gold miners in terms of what they are delivering, what they're delivering for a broad range of stakeholders, for communities, of course, and I think it was very, really interesting to see the response to the first poll question uh, and, and that uh, it's a very strong feeling that there will be increased pressure from communities. Uh, obviously, governments, both in terms of the ability for mining companies to deliver tax and royalty income, but also increasing expectations about what mining companies, particularly gold mining companies, uh, are doing and delivering and, and the value that they contribute to the societies that they are part of. But also a broader group, investors, who obviously are looking at uh, their interests, both in mining companies and, and in gold itself, uh, and indeed others, uh, and consumers in, in gold, people who think about the way the world works, increasing interest in supply chains and, uh, and, and, and where gold comes from and how it's produced. So I think we are absolutely going to see an, an increase in interest in gold, an increase in expectation on gold mining companies. And I think that uh, that is all exacerbated by the gold price being where it is. Uh, so I'll give you a few thoughts, but let me just start with a brief introduction, and I will keep this brief about the World Gold Council. We are a membership organization. Our members are the leading gold mining companies of the world, many of whom, uh, I'm delighted to say, have operations in, in Latin America. Uh, we are a global organization, and I should say from the outset uh, that whilst I've got a, a fair amount of familiarity with the gold mining industry, uh, I'm afraid I don't have that much in-depth insight into Latin America, so uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to be your, your Latin America specialist, but there are many others on this call who, who bring that to this conversation. And what we are really about, what our role is, is to ensure that the gold market continues to be healthy, that there continues to be interest in gold, that there continues to be demand for gold, that investors, consumers, uh, are interested in the role gold can play in their lives, particularly as a financial asset and understanding the role that gold plays in bringing financial security, financial resilience uh, in, in terms of uh, economic portfolios for countries 
and that includes many countries that hold gold as part of their overall reserves, but also for, for individuals, and gold has a long proven track record as a form of economic security and economic resilience. But we also think about what the gold industry collectively, in totality, needs to do to demonstrate that it has a very positive, meaningful role in the world we live in today. And indeed, that gold and the gold industry is contributing to society. And I think that's a good point to come into this question of $2,000 gold. Uh, is it good? Is it bad? What does it mean? Well, let's talk about the good. From a gold mining company perspective, uh, clearly with gold prices being elevated, there is the expectation that you are going to be able to deliver more cash flow. And all things being equal, and that's rarely the case, but all things being equal, sure, if costs are, managed, if costs are maintained, there will be incremental uh, cash flow being produced. And, and that's a good thing, yes, for the investors in those gold mining companies, but actually for that broader group of stakeholders. And one of the things that I would really like to sort of think about in, in the conversation today is the role that gold mining companies can play in distributing those proceeds of the benefits of, of gold mining, of converting a, a resource that's buried in the ground to something that has economic value, to the other stakeholders that all get part of that economic pie, to the employees who obviously take home uh, income from, from working at a gold mining company, to the communities that should prosper from being uh, connected with a gold mining operation, uh, both, yes, potentially through some donations and grants, but particularly through the economic opportunities that are created in an area as a result of a gold mine company being there, the ancillary benefits, if you like, of gold mining operations. And good gold mining companies do care about the broader economic environment where they're operating and look to strengthen that. But also gold mining companies contribute positively. Uh, we've seen many examples of that during uh, the, the last several months in terms of contributing to supporting healthcare capacity, um, supporting education around what this pandemic is, uh, what we're seeing, what we're learning. Gold at 2000 should be the opportunity for that to be extended further. And I think that's really positive and I, and I think that that is an expectation that is valid on gold mining companies. On the other side, John, and you talked about this a fair amount, that there will be expectations of increasing the tax and royalty take. There will be increased pressure on the financial position around gold mining companies. Um, and I think that you can understand that. What I would say it's important to consider in a, in a balanced way is, well, who is taking the risk and who seeds the proceeds? And this all comes back to an equitable distribution. In that, those investors who ultimately backstop gold mining companies to be able to make significant, very significant capital investments, also it is appropriate that they get a return for those investments and that that return plays out over the long time and plays out over different economic cycles. Uh, we've also got used now to the idea that there are uh, economic cycles and the gold price responds accordingly. Indeed, that for us is one of the very good reasons to, to hold gold in a balanced financial portfolio is it helps balance out some of the ups and downs that you see through those economic cycles. And so I would say, the question that governments need to be thinking about is both what is equitable, and obviously there are legal agreements in place, but this concept of, of equity, and also importantly linked to that, how do they create the environment that promotes future long-term investment? We at the World Gold Council believe very strongly that gold mining, when responsibly undertaken, and we've put a lot of work out to set out what is responsible mining and if anybody's interested, I'm very happy to talk more about the responsible gold mining principles that really clearly sets out what every mining gold mining company should be doing to operate responsibly. But when a gold mining company is able to operate responsibly, 
the economic and social benefits for the community and the country are very significant. In terms of those payments to employees, community contribution, helping support, education, healthcare, and that is the balance. And so as we move into a potentially a sustained period, again, no crystal ball, but a potentially a sustained period of, of $2,000, how can governments work with mining companies, but also really importantly, work with communities to think about the long term, to not jeopardize the short term, and to, um, if you would like, deter future investment. And there will always need to be future investment to be able to furthermore uh, be able to make a, a, an economic case for mining uh, and to be able to bring that investment on board uh, and continue to seek investors. And I think good governments want to attract good mining companies and vice versa. And I think that's going to play out quite strongly over the, the next short while as we look at 2000. So look, really interesting time for the gold industry. Lots of expectations around what gold mining companies should be doing uh, and lots of lively conversations. And I think that's a really good thing. Uh, the 2000 price definitely gives the opportunity for more contribution and for more participation, but it has to be equitable. With that, John, let me finish and uh, hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Terry. Um, and I've got a lot of questions for you, and I know um, some in the audience want to ask questions as well of the, of the WGC. I want to remind us all um, that, because some of you came and joined the webinar after Abel had walked us through how to pose a question in the webinar. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you will find a Q&A icon, or if you don't, if there's three dots, click those dots and you'll find the Q&A icon. There you can type in your question and we will address that question during our Q&A period. I would like us, uh, I'd like to also point out that in the chat icon, if you click on that and you scroll up, you will see that Abel has posted a link to the article um, that I mentioned earlier where, I, where we had forecast the disease breaking point across different countries in Latin America. And you'll see the, uh, the full explanation of that. Um, before I, I ask Augusto Kelty uh, from Peru to join, I would like to uh, pose one more poll question to the audience. So if we could move to that, Abel. And that, the question is, um, which Latin American jurisdiction offers the best opportunity for junior gold miners today? And there's 10 countries listed in alphabetical order there. Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Guyana, Mexico, Peru, and Suriname. And um, I'm very curious to see what people will tell us in light of what we've thus far um, addressed in the, uh, in the webinar, as well as, of course, um, people's own preferences. And as we await your responses, um, I want to uh, point out that Augusto will uh, be sharing some of his slides that he's put together. Augusto very recently, two weeks ago, um, left his post as Vice Minister of Mines in Peru, um, a hugely important position that, of course, uh, in, in this particular juncture of Peru's mining history is a, is a notable one. But also, Augusto, beyond his um, delving into politics, uh, has a storied career on the, uh, the working with mining companies um, as legal counsel. And um, we talked uh, before the webinar about his experience working um, with mining companies 10 years ago when uh, gold prices after the financial crisis went through a similar nosedive followed by strong increase and sustained increase and how that changed the political environment in Peru uh, and how mining companies were forced to respond to that. So um, 
a bell is putting up the responses here. Um, we clearly have some uh, strong Peru advocates uh, responding here uh, at as much as 30%, which is pretty strong endorsement of Peru out of a list of 10 gold producing countries in Latin America. Um, so that seems like a almost picture perfect uh, tangent for you to join, Augusto. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining the panel today. We look forward to your remarks and I'll uh, ask you to go ahead and share your screen as you um, begin your talk. Uh, turn on your camera and your your microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for the presentation and thanks to America's uh, Market Intelligence for the invitation to this, uh, to, to join this panel, this webinar. Um, and thank you for all the people that is over there uh, listening to us at, uh, at this time. Actually, uh, I'm very happy to, to share my thoughts on with, with you, with you too, and actually with, with Jerry Heyman, who is the representative of World Gold Council, no? specifically dealing with, with the gold medal, which, which is mainly the, the topic of this, uh, of this webinar. And, uh, and actually my remarks will come from, from wh what I would say is a producer country. You know? as, as, as we are in the market of, of gold, we have, as in any markets, we have the, 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 the offer and the demand. In this case, we, we are, I'll be talking from the experience from a producer from the offer side uh, uh, country like like Peru. Actually, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, it's very important to to mention that as opposed to what we've been looking in by, by the end of 2019, when we actually were coming to this year on a very optimistic way, and and, and now I'm gonna talk about my my last tenure as uh, 15 months as, as uh, deputy minister of mines in Peru of, of, uh, of having a third year continuous of uh, growing in investments in the mining sector. Actually, we overcame our, our, our goal was $6,000 million. We, we executed uh, more than $6,150 million in executed investments in, in that sector. So we were really very, very optimistic on, on the situation for this year. Suddenly, uh, it came the, the coronavirus and, and what happened to, to the sector, as, as, as happened to many other sectors and, uh, and as happened to many other countries, uh, it's been quite uh, surprising, unexpected. Uh, and, and in this, uh, we have to deal with this, with this situation uh, with the particular uh, also, uh, complex uh, infrastructure of health that we have in our in countries like like Peru. You know, the situation of, of of the sanitary situation, the lack of infrastructure for for overcoming uh, this type of pandemics uh, was actually uh, a very important also matter to to take a, a look at. You no, know? if if we compare to countries like Australia or Canada, which are also very important players, and Peru is one of the important players in. In, in the mining sector, the difference in, in what the health infrastructure and, and, and the situation got to do with this particular situation at, at this time. Uh, but this task was, was uh, of course, difficult, was complex, but also involved a lot of crea creative, uh, 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 creative issues from, from our side, from from people in the government that, that we work together on this, but also from the private sector. No? In this situation, we all have to, to get our best in, in order to overcome this, this situation, which we are trying to overcome. But, but I can tell you from, from, from my experience in the ministry uh, a few, few, few weeks ago is that uh, we are still in, in the process of, of reactivating the, 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 of the reactivation of the sector, actually the sector if we see the numbers of the energy of the main mining producers in Peru, they were in, in the same levels of consumption of energy as, as they were in, in, in times of pre-pandemia. So that shows that reactivation is, is in place. Uh, actually, the production from Ju June to uh, from May to June and to July is being just growing and and and, and keep. Uh, closing the gaps of exportations if we compare those numbers from 2019. 
In this, let me let me show you a little bit of, uh, of, the, of the presentation that I that I make for for this event and just uh, basically what I wanted to to present here is uh, wh why these views from from a country like like Peru and and then a little of the okay. Uh, of course, Peru is a is a is a leading country in the mining sector. We are in production number one in in gold, in zinc, in lead, in tin in Latin America. In uh, worldwide, we are number two in in copper, in silver, in zinc. If we talk about reserves as well, we are number one in Latin America in in silver, in lead, but we are number two in also in gold, in copper, in in zinc and molybdenum. No? So. We, we are really talking about a, a country that is a very important and interesting player for for the sector worldwide and and actually for the country as well no uh, actually a few minutes ago john was talking about the 20 year growing of peru in the past two decades uh, and, and and this continuous growth was basically supported by this engine that was the mining sector no as, as we see, you know, if you see about GDP, we represent uh, uh, approximately between 8 to 10 percent of, of Peruvian GDP. We generate with that. Uh, there, there are some studies on this around 15 to 17 percent of what the, 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 the Peruvian treasury collects from the, from the, private, se from the private sectors. Uh, and, and in terms of exportations, we represent around 60% of what they do exports. You know? So that means that we are a very important player for helping on making the macroeconomic stability of the country during this situation, okay? in general, you know, in, in the country. But of the deposits quality in Peru, you know, we are a country that, of course, we have a, a, a very important presence worldwide on copper and, and and in Peru is the, the main product that we export in, in our country is copper. But in gold, we are also a very important player uh, that also represents uh, uh, around 17% of what we export. But, but also in terms of explorations, and that's important for, for what you just uh, respond, many people on what, what, what the scenario for, for junior miners in in Latin America, and Peru is one of the top countries that receive budgets for explorations worldwide. No, we are around number four, number fifth uh, last year in terms of what uh, we collect from explorations budgets worldwide for, uh, and, and and that's basically for two or three minerals: copper, gold, and and zinc, which are the major ones. And the portfolios. Uh, as is, if we see in terms of numbers, we have in the portfolio of mining explorations, 21 projects in gold, 18 projects in copper, eight in, in zinc. We are in different stages of, the, of advancement. So that, that shows the importance and that shows the presence and that shows what is going on in the explorations area, which actually are the ones that keep the sustainability of the sector, no? in spite of the production side, which is, as I'm saying, close to 90, 95% of, of, of recovery in, in production at these times. Uh, having having to, 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 to say that about Peru from a regional approach, uh, let me tell you just briefly uh, in two, three slides what I, I think we should be looking at in general, the investors and people interested in the mining sector, no? Uh, what's the attractiveness for, for, for mining investors uh, worldwide in, in, region, in the region? In, if we see at the Fraser Institute, the last survey published by them, Chile in position number 17, Peru in position number 24, and Mexico in position 38 are, are the first three countries in Latin America for, for purposes of investment in the mining sector. Uh, of course, the, the, the potential in terms of the geological potential, Peru is, is in the number 12 position, so it's a very important market. I believe that's also why many of the people respond to the poll uh, recently that Peru is a very important or, or quite important jurisdiction for them. Uh, the fiscal framework for, for investments, no, uh, is also very important for, for investors to, 
to have in mind was the, was the income tax rate. Uh, if we compare in Peru, we have 29.5% a corporate fiscal tax uh, income tax rate, which uh, actually put us on a on a competitiveness uh, on a competitiveness situation if we compare to other markets in Latin America. And actually, if we add to the income tax the other taxes that were created in the previous government uh, eight years ago, uh, probably that the fiscal uh, that the, the total fiscal uh, rate in Peru totalized amount forty eight percent between forty seven and forty eight percent, which actually put us on the on an average on that in the in the average. Uh, 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 level of the of the whole jurisdictions that are important for the mining sector, no? and and that's also important as as John was saying as well that we have to take a look on what 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 would go on, going on after uh, what we are happening in this year, uh, how governments are going to react in, in order to try to collect more monies for uh, doing the recovery of their economies. But also to have a comprehensive look of, of the situation, uh, and I would say in, in, in Peru, but actually in Latin America in general, in the regional, in the region, in spite of the attractiveness that, that we've been talking and the fiscal, it's very important to take a look in, in this current situation at what would happen with the social issues, the social considerations, social conflicts that we have in the in the several regions and countries, and actually that have increased with the coronavirus and the COVID-19. The political matters, no? What what's gonna be the the decisions that the governments would face? What's gonna be the the results of the elections that some countries will have between now and, and next year? Uh, also, very important when we are talking about gold in in sim, in countries like Peru, what will happen with informal mining? What will happen with the also with illegal activities? No, with these prices of gold uh, coming to historic price of uh, around close to $2,000 per ounce. It's very important to see also what would happen with, with, with these uh, two particular issues. And uh, fi finally, with this, I, I just want to, to address the question that John has mentioned to me on what was the experience uh, 10 years ago in, in Peru, no? And, and uh, I could say, uh, from my experience at that time, in, in the, actually in the mining sector, but working at the, at the private sector at that time as general counsel for a transnational company, it's, it's been that during those years, as you can see in in the investment side, of course, no, in 2010, 11, 12, 13, there was a grow of investments. So it's something that we should expect to happen with these prices of the of gold and also copper with the recovery that China has been doing uh, lately. We expect with these top two products, uh, of course, there would be some instability in some cases because of, of the, the possibility of reactivating the, the operations, the possible suspension that some of them will happen, but we expect an increase of investments that happen in that, in that uh, situation with those prices. Uh, in terms of production, uh, actually, the the impact, as you can see here also in Peru at those years 2010, 11, and 12, if we compare to what happened before and what happened in 2013, 2014, 2015, it was a really growth also of production. So it's not only more money coming to invest to, to develop new mines, to, to, to do more uh, investment explorations, and, and also in implementation or or, or to to increase their their current capacities, but also the, the same production of, of the companies. It, it was another important uh, way to look at this. And also what happened at, at that time, as you can see, 2010, 11, 12, was a, an increase of the amounts of exportations in the mining sector. Uh, we were talking about $7,000 million, $10,000 million in 2011, 2012. And then there was a decline of this. No? So that's also another another important indicator on what could happen in with these current prices of the situation. And of course, finally, uh, it's very important for producer countries like like us in Peru uh, 
I always repeat this, you know, in the mining sector, we have to always take a look of what, what's going on abroad, what's going on outside our country. It's not only important to see what's going on in Peru, but what's happened with the region, what happened worldwide. We, we, and in this particular scenario of the coronavirus, we need to take a look very, very serious, all the countries of what's going on with the destiny of our exportations, in particular in gold. We need to follow what's going on with Switzerland, what's going on with Canada, what's going on with India, what's going, what going on with the Emirates, uh, the Arabs, uh, and the United States, which, and China, no? which are important buyers of our production uh, in gold but also uh, some of them in, in copper. No? Uh, with this, I, I wanna just uh, stop, uh, John. Uh, I, I tried to, to, to make a summary of, of different topics, but I think it was important to see why, why coming from Peru, what's going on with the regional approach and what happened 10 years ago. And probably I can comment a little bit more, more of the risk and opportunities that you mentioned at the beginning, also from a, from a producer's country in, in, the, in the next round. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Augusto. Um, again, thank you both, Terry and Augusto. We're now going to um, uh, begin our sort of open questions and answer session. Again, uh, at this time, um, we have eight minutes remaining in our official time that we uh, put in our invitation, but we will remain online up to as late as 38 minutes from now to answer uh, as many questions as the audience would like to pose us. And I'm going to give the audience a few more minutes to uh, scribble any more additional questions. Again, go to the Q&A icon to insert your questions. Terry, I have a question for you. Um, <clears throat> the last time, as Augusto was pointing out 10 years ago, when resource prices rose and the, the investment climate changed, um, there was a lot of talk, and I believe uh, at the time, I can't remember if it was the IMF may have opined upon this, but there was talk about miners uh, moving towards um, royalty formulas that were flexible in the sense that they shared both the risk and return of, gold, of, of, of mineral prices. So when mineral prices went up, um, the, the amount that was shared proportionately would also increase with the producer nations. And when prices dropped, uh, instead of having rigid formulas that would essentially drive mines into inoperability, um, the, the host country would receive far fewer uh, royalties as the mine was adjusting to a low price environment. Um, how does the World Gold Council feel about this? What have you seen uh, in talking to miners about this issue as we move into a high price environment? Thank you. So, so look, I think it's a, a really interesting question. And uh, in some ways, going back to my remarks, the need for equitable distribution is really important. What equitable means is going to differ in, in different contexts. And so it's really hard to put in place a sort of a universal formula that this is the right answer, uh, depending on very often the resource and, and how that's actually, um, what, what, what is there and how easy it is to access, the costs of, of actually uh, th that are required of the investment to put the capital in to be able to uh, access the, the, the gold reserves, um, the, the broader set of considerations be it around the community, be it around infrastructure. It's very tricky to just say, here is a one size fits all um, answer. That being said, um, certainly there's a commitment towards equitable and, and, and um, a recognition that mining companies, of course, need to pay the taxes and royalties that, that they should. There's also commitment in terms of helping uh, a broad group of, of stakeholders, including governments and the finance ministries that are working through these decisions to understand the costs of mining. And I think uh, one of the things in, in response, in part, uh, say 10 years ago, that we at the World Gold Council did is we were asked by our members and really did this piece of work on behalf of our members to help put out a new cost standard for what it actually costs to, to mine an ounce of gold. Uh, and many people might be familiar with that, so the, the all-in cost and all-in sustaining costs metric. 
And a big part of that was really to help increase transparency on what it costs to get an ounce of gold out of the ground. Uh, one of the challenges with that metric is just how do you then think about the cost that's already been uh, captured in, in actually putting the, the capital contribution up, up front and, and how do you think about the long term and the all in cost is designed to do that. The all in sustaining cost is really just looking at the ongoing operation. So even there you start to get, all right, well, what should I be looking at and how do I think about this? And we couldn't get to a single single metric because there's uh, different sets of circumstances depending on where a mining company is in its development and evolution. So essentially, uh, I know our members are, are very committed towards tax transparency. Indeed, it's one of the, the principles included in these responsible gold mining principles, and there's strong support for that. The specifics of what the contracts are, are going to, uh, and it's important that they are looked at, at a, a, on an individual basis and respond to the circumstances of, of that particular operation. Great, thank you. It's, I think what's clear um, that we've seen is um, how aware governments are of um, the profitability of gold miners um, in times like this. And um, as you say, the interpretation of what is equitable distribution uh, becomes open to interpretation. Um, and you have mature mining jurisdictions like Chile and Peru, where I think Politicians have an excellent understanding of the industry and its economics, and then you have much less mature um, but emerging gold uh, markets like Colombia and Ecuador, Panama, the Dominican Republic, where there's interesting reserves, but there isn't nearly the level of maturity of understanding of, of the industry. And, and so that, they, they become more vulnerable to sort of political pressures. Um, and, and, and if I may, just to add to that, look, I, I think... Um, what we heard from Augusto was fascinating in terms of the journey that Peru has been through. Uh, and there's a reason why Chile and Peru are high on the Fraser Index. And that certainly gets noticed by mining companies and, and investors in those mining companies. So, uh, again, there, there is the need to balance. Absolutely, everybody recognizes the severe economic and financial challenges we're in today. But ability, being able to plan for the long term and, and bring in good investment to, to your country is, is really important for long-term economic health. Absolutely. We have a number of questions, good ones that are being posed, and I thank the audience for that. I have a quick question. Augusto, uh, in your graph, you pointed out how, you know, when the price of gold began to drop in late third, or I guess it was midway through 2013, investment petered off. And um, I've attended uh, one of the regional um, mining conferences held in Lima every October um, for the last, I guess, four years. And it was, it was tremendous to see, you know, where you see a real change overnight is the financial prospects and the investment prospects of junior miners and how we've seen very little exploration activity uh, in those declining years of pricing. If you were to look at Peru today, between exploration development and the arrival of, you know, large industrial miners, where is there a need um, to build a healthier mining industry? Is it in exploration? Is it in uh, the development of ex already explored mines? Is it in the maturing of mid-size um, operating mines into something bigger, where do you see the need for investment greatest? Uh, well, very, very important question. And I would say with, with, with this situation, of course, the investment in all the different mining sites or strata will be, will be really more than welcome in our, in our country, you know? But uh, coming from a more specific view uh, from, from my previous and just uh, just previous experience as, as deputy minister in Peru, I would say that uh, explorations would be the, an area that we as a country has to really focus more since once companies are in production uh, with the management capacity that they have, with the logistics that they can manage, 
I think situations like this one, they will overcome the situation. I think the, the miners that already in production, they are, they are uh, very responsible. They, 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 they know what they are facing. We have a safety culture happen for, for the last 10, 20 years in Peru. And you can see with that, uh, the, 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 the numbers of accidents in the last 10 years uh, coming down to 50, 60%. So all of this, I think, will really help on, on, on the production side. But explorations really need to get a, a more focus. Actually, last December, uh, the government, uh, uh, we issued a, a devolution of, of VAT for explorations, and we have issued that law for the next three years. So that's uh, important news for, for this. Also, we have recently, uh, I think it was a month ago, we have issued a new environmental uh, regulation for explorations in, in Peru, adding some, uh, what is called the uh, silencio administrativo positivo, the, uh, the, the uh, positive silent for, for, for certain proceedings that got to do with, with the mining sector. So we are conscious that this is really an, an important uh, area that we have to focus and we've been doing certain am amendments to those areas. The other sector, that is really worth to take a look, look at these times is the uh, small mining and traditional mining, which we have the formal sector and we have the informal part. Of course, we have the legal side and the legal side has to be fight, has to be fight with, with the tools that any government has to, to avoid uh, these illegal activities that, that actually got to do with, with, with other problems. But, but we, we really need to, to take a, a more, uh, I would say, comprehensive approach of the informal mining sector, in particular in countries like Peru. The gold is very important for that informal sector, no? which is different situation than, for example, in Chile, where in Chile you have a, a, a small sector, a small mining sector, but for copper. Uh, so it's, it's different in a scenario. And, uh, and in those, I think, are, are really opportunities of, uh, of investments and, and, and an overcoming situation uh, with this. Now, of course, also with the with the look at the long-term run, no? The mining sector, if the mining sector has something different to probably many other, so most of the other activities is that we have a really long-term vision. No? Other activities probably think of on, on making a, I don't know, a business, a restaurant, a commercial business for one year, six months, two years, three years. In the mining sector, you get the returns after 10 years, 15, 20 years. So that's the scenario we have to look at this. Of course, the coronavirus is gonna remain, it's gonna stay for, for months, as you are just mentioning, but we will overcome this and we need to look at, at the at the long term with, with probably uh, taking a closer look to explorations and what we can do with these small miners and informal area, which can also contribute to countries like, like Peru. Excellent. In fact, uh, we've got a couple of questions related to artisanal mining. I'm going to take a shot at, at addressing them, and I invite um, Terry and I will still also to add their comments. But uh, one of the questions was, you know, will high gold prices bring uh, more artisanal miners uh, into the fold? And absolutely, they're the first to respond. And if you think about the fact that so much uh, unemployment, um, which frankly in Latin America, almost everywhere is, is is way underreported because it tends to track only the formal employment and that can be as little as 30% of all the whole labor force. So uh, given the disproportionate impact on the informal economies of Latin America that, that, uh, that lockdowns have, the quarantines have, um, there's going to be lots of people who may have dabbled in artisanal mining in the past and moved on to other jobs will go back to it. Um, so there will be literally, you know, and, and, you know, it changes country to country. In Peru, they've organized a lot of their artisanal and formal miners in such a way uh, through collectives that they uh, have ways of sharing resources, um, um, working towards better standards. And a lot of them have, um, you know, smelters that, that, that specifically serve that community. In other countries like Colombia, informal mining is often associated with the worst elements of society, uh, the laundering of monies from illicit sources. 
um, and informal or illegal mining in Colombia directly um, is responsible for what is generally a negative image of gold mining uh, by most of the population. In a country like Guyana, the pork knockers, as they're known, are almost a, they're almost like the, 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 the 49ers of, uh, of, of, you know, of California gold rush. There's a, uh, almost everyone in the working class environment in, in Guyana has spent weeks or months in the bush looking for gold. And so the informal mining there is almost like a rite of passage for a lot of Guyanese. And um, you have to be careful how you, in other words, how you phrase it. Uh, is it negative like illegal? Is it innocuous like artisanal? Um, but the point is that for uh, formal miners, be they mid or large in size, their concessions will be invaded by artisanal miners in a greater numbers uh, in, in this particular employment plus high gold price environment. And so how do they deal with that? Um, <clears throat> you know, in the past, the practice was to uh, police them off of the property, uh, often using strong, strong arm tactics. Um, but in today's environment where 200 million Latin Americans have a smartphone and can film that sort of heavy handed policing, um, that is just not reputationally viable. Um, so I would say the forward thinking miners have worked out ways to allow artisanal mining to operate um, as long as they maintain certain standards, both from a labor standpoint as well as from labor, stand oh, sorry, environmental standpoint, such that um, the impact that they make uh, through their artisanal work is not going to either damage the concession or damage the reputation of their concession and of their company. I, I think of Lundin in uh, Fruta del Norte as being a, an exceptional example of a company that worked with informal miners and allowed them to continue mining. It was not a great threat to their ability to mine uh, with their modern techniques. And by engaging with those people and um, allowing them to continue working, it was a way to keep the local communities who are often supported by informal miners uh, on side with the mine instead of working against the mine. And so these are uh, the challenge of informal miners and how you work with them is only going to become that much greater in this pricing and employment environment in which we're in. Um, Terry and, and Augusto, I, I welcome you to, to, to add to my remarks. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll move on. There's, there's some other interesting questions here. Yeah, look, um, I, I, John, I, I would agree with that. And, and clearly, we're going to see, uh, we already have seen an increase in artisanal miners um, for, for the reasons you set out. The lack of alternative livelihoods is a big driver, as well as the gold price. And yes, I think there is uh, increasing pressure on large scale miners to, to manage those situations. And uh, everybody's still trying to find the best practice and what that is and how to learn. Uh, there's a need for all stakeholders, again, to be involved. Governments uh, at a local level have a role to play as well. Um, the one other thing I would say is, look, I think there's going to be uh, increasing attention paid by people in the supply chain to where the gold comes from and how it's being produced. And certainly for large scale mines with the responsible gold mining principles, it's now very clear what is expected of large scale gold miners, what they need to do to demonstrate that they're operating uh, appropriately uh, around the environment, around social, from a governance perspective, around getting assurance on that. Uh, for artisanal miners, not so. Uh, in many cases, and, and I recognize movements towards formalization, and, and that's certainly very much encouraged. And I think that's going to make it even harder for artisanal miners to, to get their gold into the formal supply chain. And, and that's a concern um, where those miners are operating uh, with, with the right um, legal uh, permits in place and, and, are, um, and are operating responsibly. So Yes, there are some, some big questions around artisanal mining, both what it means, if you like, on the ground, uh, at the margins of concessions of large scale mining, but also for the, the gold industry as a whole, um, what, what are the reputational challenges to gold 
for or from gold that is coming out of, frankly, some of the, uh, the, the less well um, managed artisanal operations. And just uh, uh, and, and complement uh, of what Terry has mentioned, and, uh, and actually some more things before on on your on your comments, uh, John. Uh, well, this le, 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 has to be realistic here. No, there's gonna be there's gonna be a, a, a drop of uh, a, a lack of funds for the treasury in governments like like Peru. No, or not the response that the, the Ministry of Economy and Finance is doing in the country for for trying to reactivate the different sectors in in Peru. Of course, there will be need of, of funds next year, so there will be a social pressure and there will be a political pressure because, for example, in Peru we are coming to elections next year. And, and with this, uh, the areas uh, that you mentioned also at the beginning, you know, these informal areas that we have the opportunities uh, in countries like Peru, and we have to look at these opportunities now. I think now is the time, for example, to, to, to really look at an opportunity or, or a way to try to bring more of the informal miners and I'm not talking the legal, no? I'm talking the informal, the, the, the artisanal that can work even in, in areas that are not important for, 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 for big companies, for work class operations, for different reasons. There, there, there happen to be these type of areas. We have to organize those and, and try to, to see how to formalize them on a quicker way as we have been doing since the last uh, 10 to, to, to 20 years that we started this, this process of, of formalization in, in Peru. That means that we need also to innovate on the way of, of look at this. Actually, with these prices, even the possibility that this minor sector contribute with funds to the treasury, it will, it, it, it will, make, it will make sense, it, it will worth the, the opportunity to really take a look on this on a very serious approach now and, and, and try to, to come with a, a a solution that, for example, uh, uh, could be uh, bringing technology innovation to them uh, from the government side, could be, and as opposed to get this percentage of retribution by them to the fiscal uh, to, the, to, to the fiscal authority. So there could be a, a two-way uh, approach, no, on, on a way that uh, the government the governments need to offer something for them to get formalized. And of course, uh, to be on the on the on the formal on the formal side, to be on a safer to, to work on a safer way, but for that, uh, an approach to 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 bring to them technology, to bring to them innovative ways to operate, uh, even the private formal sector, you no, know, probably can also cooperate on this. You no, know? there should be a really commitment between the the, the big scale mines and the medium sized uh, mines with this informal and artisanal sector. Of course, uh, I repeat, no, we have to, to also manage the illegal side. There is also a huge risk on, with this situation on what could happen, for example, with the alluvial mining in the Amazon area, in the jungle uh, of Peru. So, and, and, and that's something that there, there, there's no be a way that this can grow and keep, uh, and, and keep uh, making harm to the to the jungle and to the to the Amazonas uh, area in Peru. So I think there are these two situations that we have to to take a look. And of course, this all is tied with the informal situation that you mentioned at the beginning, close to 70, 75 percent informal. There, there's these numbers studies for 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 years in in Peru. And probably there's an opportunity now to do very particular with that informal mining sector, probably not dealing with all the informal sectors, but with the informal mining sector, which can be looked at some areas that we know they are, and we can work in this particular three, four, five areas that, that really accumulate more, more of them and work with them in, on, a, on, a, on a solution. And actually that, that they, they can also contribute to the, to the treasury that, that will have a, a pressure, of course, next year, for sure. Yeah, I think that will be the, uh you know, what's in it for the government to make the effort to formalize and to incentivize these companies is uh, their own fiscal imperative. Um, I'm sure uh, both Terry and Agosto have watched, if not dealt directly with 
the increased interest by Chinese mining companies um, in the gold sector. Uh, <clears throat> Chinese mining companies, of course, began primarily as state-owned enterprises uh, reaching out um, into Latin America uh, 10, 12 years ago. Today, a lot of them are privately funded um, companies, and uh, it's therefore a much more diverse field of mining companies. Um, uh, many of the stereotypes that were uh, associated with Chinese mining practices, I think, are uh, can no longer stick. Uh, there is varied uh, assortment of companies as, as any country's origins. Um, but I'm curious what you've seen um, in terms of changing attitudes of Chinese mining companies in terms of their ESG um, protocols, um, their ability, of course, to work with the Chinese government to issue bilateral loans to uh, countries and use that political leverage, which is, let's face it, that's what uh, the Americans have done for years. It's what the British and the Dutch and uh, the French used to do and still do in parts of the world. Um, how will this environment of fiscally challenged countries uh, and the ability of China to work with its companies to combine bilateral lending with uh, the interests of its mining companies, is, can we expect more activity from Chinese mining companies uh, in Latin America or frankly, Africa or other parts of the world as well, given, given the, the fiscal crisis we're in? John, I, I think it's a great question and um, there's no question. China is uh, increasingly uh, wanting to not only uh, demonstrate its, its leadership position globally in the gold market, but also use that as a, as a means of engaging uh, more broadly. And so um, I think listeners will probably know China is the world's largest gold consumer. It's also the world's largest gold producer. Uh, and actually, it's the world's largest gold importer as well. So China has a, a hugely important role to play uh, in, the, in the global gold market. And look, we, we see that we've had operations in, in China for over 20 years and um, have been part of the efforts to uh, support uh, the, the opening up of the Chinese gold market and the recognition that the gold has a very important role to play in the, the Chinese economy. And we're aware certainly of the increasing steps uh, that are being taken by the Chinese gold industry uh, to, to internationalize and internationalize broadly. Um, uh, they, they talk about letting in and stepping out and actually for years, the, the Chinese gold market was more domestically orientated and it's certainly getting more international. So it wouldn't surprise me if we saw uh, more cooperation and more engagement, more investment by Chinese mining companies elsewhere. Uh, on your question specifically around ESG standards, I think you're right uh, in that sometimes perceptions are a little bit outdated. And um, part of, uh, I guess, the um, upside of, of being... Uh, to some extent, a little isolated uh, until recently is you develop things differently. And so I don't think that the Chinese gold industry is coming from a per se worse place and then um, sort of the, the mining companies we're, we're familiar with from North America and, and Australia and South Africa and, and indeed Latin America. Uh, they just uh, come from a, a different orientation. That being said, I think there is a huge amount of interest from the Chinese gold companies to learn uh, from their peers globally. Certainly, we at the World Gold Council uh, have a number of Chinese members. I expect that will increase. And all of our Chinese members are uh, very engaged in the responsible gold mining principles and, and are, like the rest of our members, committed to implementing these. Uh, of course, you have to understand what it means in a Chinese context and, and Chinese laws. But there is that real commitment there and that real recognition of why this is important. And look, from my personal experience, I've, I've seen that change over the last decade, certainly. So, yes, China is going to play a bigger role. Uh, I think it's going to play a bigger role in, in lots of aspects of the global gold market. Uh, and with that comes their, their increased responsibility and recognition 
the ESG factors are important and it's certainly something that the Chinese gold industry is very committed to. Excellent. Augusto, I'm sure you dealt a lot with um, Chinese mining investment and bilateral lending, of course, um, from China to Peru has been significant over the last 10 years. Um, what's your perspective on Chinese miners and, and their changing approach to business? Uh, well, that's a very important and complex question. No? And in spite of uh, all what Terry has just mentioned on gold, and I, I, will, I will leave that to, to Terry, who has a better worldwide approach on, on, that, uh, on that particular scenario than, than I could say uh, from, from here. But what I can tell is that the experience that we have from, from Peru, no? uh, a, a producer, uh, mining country, receiving invest, investments from in the mining sector. Actually, the mining sector in Peru is a private sector. We don't have public owned uh, companies uh, uh, that that uh, operate in, in our in our market you no know, as, as in, there are in other countries we, uh, our mining sector is basically a private sector operated it is private sector that 100% private sector operated uh, so uh, china is an important investor for the mining sector but not on gold Actually, their presence is been really on basic metals. They've been, uh, they have a very important presence in copper uh, mines, for example, MM, MMG Las Bambas, no? which is uh, one of the top producers, copper top producers in Peru, is operated by a, by a Chinese uh, uh, company. Also, they are uh, very active in um, iron, there is uh, operations in, in Ica by, by Shogun in, in, in Iron, a very, very important operation for the country. Actually, they finalized last, last year their increase of production of their plant. Uh, with this, uh, they got 40% more production on, on iron, which also has benefits for the exportations of our country. And, and uh, actually, Chinalco is running, Chinalco is running a uh, a very important, uh, say, is one of the top three mines that are being built now in Peru. Uh, is one of the three projects that we reactivate in the in the first phase of the reactivation of the economy last May, and, uh, and, and they, this is a project that they are uh, also increasing the production of the project Toromocho, and that uh, increase implies. Uh, around one thousand and three hundred million dollars uh, for, for for this project. So, uh, what, what I can tell is is that the participation of the China, the Chinese uh, companies in Peru, of course, they are also in in many uh, of the projects that are in explorations and also in in line for a start of uh, construction of mines in 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 process. Pampa del Pongo, Galeno. And there are some other projects that are in, in on, on the portfolio that, that we have in in Peru. Of course, their participation as well. I think, at least my impression in in, in the last uh, 15 to 20 years that I've been involved with the mining sector is also they have changed their way to operate, their way to to interact with uh, with the community, with the uh, in in the country. They are trying. To, of course, in in Peru we have world-class operations. So I think they are also involved in this uh, uh, particular way to, to operate as well in, in, on that way. So we can expect, uh, I believe, more participation from them, at least in, in Peru, in terms of copper, in terms of iron, in terms of, of zinc. Uh, uh, I, I, I haven't, I don't recall now on, on, on gold, particularly in Peru, but also we can, uh, we, we can see uh, that the importance, again, that we need to look on what's going on in, in this international relation between China that you mentioned and USA. I think this now tension between the two countries last year was commercial. This year got to do with the uh, health issue, health problem of the coronavirus, but it's still this problem between USA and China. And this has an impact in countries like Peru, because we are talking of of that two probably most important in general at least buyers of 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 of, of metals for the for the peruvian for
for the Peruvian market, no? And uh, this is basically the, the, to, to add to your question, thanks. Great, thank you, Augusto. Um, we're, we're drawing close to the time period that we've um, uh, certainly obliged our panelists to, to spend with us. We've answered most of the questions. There's a few questions that ask us to somehow forecast the price of gold and the price of certain currencies five years from now. I, for one, um, probably would be sitting on a beach somewhere if I had the ability to forecast the price of gold or a currency five years from now, um, having retired years ago. But, uh, but let, me, let me answer, because it's uh, Erwin Acosta asked a question, uh, what can be expected two th to three years in the future as a consequence of now having a gold price increasing due to to investors' high expectations combined with countries expecting more profit. Well, in fact, Erwin, you've, you've laid the ground for this entire webinar. That is, in fact, uh, the dilemma, if you like, of uh, rising, rising gold prices. Um, if history is, uh, provides the sort of uh, wisdom and lessons learned that it normally does, we know that when we've been in this situation before, and I think certainly 2008, 2009 uh, through to 2013 was a reasonable approximation of the kind of economic dilemma we're in today. Now there's obviously this one was driven by a pandemic. We also have a very interesting disruptive element to this economic crisis that has to do with a movement towards sort of electronic commerce and such. But for the purposes of our webinar, um, there were similar patterns then as there are today. Uh, massive unemployment, capital flight out of emerging markets, um, unemployment coupled with rising uh, uh, precious metal prices. And what we saw then and what we anticipate to see now is, first of all, junior miners suddenly having the cash to pursue projects that they didn't have just 12 months ago. Um, gearing up and hungry to uh, develop mines. We have um, host countries desperate to produce employment, uh, desperate to attract investment, but also under tremendous uh, fiscal pressure to um, balance their budgets uh, or, or come closer to balancing their budgets to replace lost revenues from uh, a strongly declined VAT uh, revenue stream. Um, you have informal mining sectors that are responding already very quickly to rising prices that bring a certain employment relief uh, to many of these isolated communities um, and also bring with them certain political pressures to be protected as a economic uh, component of the, uh, of the greater country's economy. But you also have the needs of miners who um, require a st more streamlined permitting process so they can get to production. But also, you know, a lot of, a lot of stakeholders looking to miners to support them in times of, uh, of scarcity. And what this will lead to is more investment, but more conflict, uh, more opportunity, but more risk. And it is precisely in times like this where um, intelligence, people on the ground, people who understand what's going on and can feed the decision-making process of miners, but also of the stakeholders, of governments, uh, so that they understand the best practices to follow. And also um, they, can, they can make decisions that are balanced that will attract investment, but also satisfy those stakeholders who've become much more vocal and much better armed with the ability to bring their disputes and their grievances to a global stage. So uh, we are in for a more vocal, um, more rowdy, uh, more money going into mining than ever before, um, but higher stakes for host countries. So strap your seat belts. I think uh, this industry is in for a bit of a wild ride over the next couple of years. And we certainly hope to be um, part of that and uh, a useful ally to, to miners and to governments. And I know Augusto has a very storied uh, miner in, in Peru who now operates as a consultant 
Terry, who uh, sits in an organization that um, is tasked with guiding uh, best practices to the industry. We will all be um, regular parts of that, and we look forward to future interactions with you, the audience, and uh, to future webinars and to working with you. Thanks, everyone, for your time today. Thank you very much, Terry and Agosto. Abel, as always, for uh, setting us up and keeping us on the right path. It's been a real pleasure, and we look forward to the next one. All the best.